Hello, good evening, and welcome to Ancestor House. My name is Dami Akanusi. I'm a filmmaker and broadcast journalist, and tonight I'm your host. So welcome to our wonderful platform created by the wonderful Nana Camille Yarbrough. Now, as you know, the show's all about finding the inspirational stories uh, that service people of color, um, but also to show a, a different cultural perspective um, in the landscape that is filled with so many beautiful stories about the human experience. But specifically today, we're going to be focusing on what I would describe as the African experience. No matter how you perhaps categorize yourselves, maybe it's black Caribbean or black British as I am, or Nigerian black British as I must remember to say, otherwise my family will certainly have my head. But um, when it comes to our stories, we need to have people championing the you know, the, the depth of who we are as a people in the diaspora. And certainly film festivals do that, but certainly in particular, the African Diaspora International Film Festival, which is now in its 21st year. And today on Ancestor House, I have fabulous guests and the founder of the International Diaspora Film Festival and various filmmakers as well. So I invite you to come on in, because if you don't know by now, you have arrived at Ancestor House, and welcome. Now, for those of you on Twitter, for example, uh, my handle is at DarklingDami, D-A-R-K-L-I-N-G-D-A-M-I. And you can certainly follow me there and find out a little bit more about what's happening in your beautiful city, New York. Learn and tell our story, heal the pain, and raise the glory, tell it, tell it. We must learn and tell our story, heal the pain, and raise the glory, tell it, tell it. Not to know the family story is bad, not to want to know it is worse. For to pass on ignorance to someone is like, it's like passing on a curse. And it will curse your father, curse your mother, curse your sister, curse your brother. And every time you come close to one another, it will be there in between to separate and instigate. We must learn and tell our story. We must learn and tell our story for ourselves. No one else can... This is Ancestor House. Yeah, I... <laughs> Um, as you can see, um, we are now in our beautiful space and um, Ronaldo is our first person that I would like to introduce uh, to our wonderful Ancestor House audience because you being the founder of the African Diaspora International Film Festival, uh, you know, people come to you as like, please champion my film, like help me distribute it around the world, get people to see it. Such an important role. Tell me about this festival and who you are. Well, the, the festival began, as we all know, uh, 21 years ago. And uh, the festival is presented by Armat and Productions, a film distribution company. Uh, many of the ideas have been discussed all along these 21 years. We did not start the way we are now. It was a one-week event. Uh, we held it that year, 1993, at the Cinema Village. But the editorial line of the film festival has more or less remained the same. Uh, we go out there and find films depicting stories about the human experience of people of color, with a special emphasis on people of African descent. And that has led us to uh, not only see the drama of the life of people of African descent, but also the beauty, the poetry, and that in incredible development that we have experienced in the film industry, in these films, and different people we have met. So far, we are very happy because when we started I, uh, in here in New York City in 1993, even the concept of the African diaspora was debatable. Little by little, it got known, and today, the festival is held in Washington, D.C., uh, in Chicago and in Paris, France, uh, smaller versions of these events. Nevertheless, the same editorial line, the same uh, enthusiasm, I should say, and most of all, the understanding of this thing we call the African diaspora. Exactly. So now, this let's just clarify: what is this thing called the African diaspora? Well, I was born uh, in the Caribbean. 
I have Jamaican and Haitian lines, and I was always educated in the understanding that I am a person, a black person, whose origins are in Africa. I interacted with people who felt the same way, and then when I had the opportunity of visiting Africa, I understood many things that I did not understand. Uh, most, most of all, I realized that uh, even though in some cases we do not speak the same language, we have a common vibe. And I also found more common things than differences in many cases. So that was an encouragement, that was a motivation, and that was most of all the understanding that led me to write uh, my dissertation at Columbia University, and this is the beginning of the festival. I wrote a dissertation on how to use uh, these films in the classroom because I began my teaching career here in New York City in uh, mm, schools where a large number of students from the African diaspora, different places but the same uh, element. And that led me to write, and the writing led me to films, and the films led me to this position I have today with my partner in crime, Diara, <laughs> who's been with me since, I mean, from the very beginning. Oh, wonderful. And I remember meeting you back in the day, well, not in the day, but it was like <laughs> 2008, not that long ago, but it feels so long, yeah. um, you know, in the filmmaking world um, at the Pan-African Film Festival. That's right. And, you know, in just coming to America and doing that circuit, and especially that circuit with the, you know, the Pan-African, the diaspora, all of these different festivals, it was just really, um, you know, inspiring to see that collectively in different areas and states mm. in America that you guys are there you know, championing these films and making it work for many, many years. Yes, yes. I mean, it is something important to say that we are part of a movement of images and ideas that are systematically and very persistently trying to convey the essence of who we are. I'm not going to tell you that things are, um, are I mean, this is not heaven, let me put it that <laughs> way. But comparatively speaking, we have gotten much, much better. If I am um, calling uh, from my perspective as a film distributor, uh, I am very um, aware that uh, it's not e easy to release a film, but many of the films that we have released in theaters and, you know, are in the imagination of people. I'm talking about the famous Kirikou and the Sorceress. I'm talking about, for example, at this precise moment, two of our films are going to be competed in the NAACP Awards. I'm talking about the Pirogue. Uh, the film from Senegal and La Playa DC, the film from Colombia, which is the first film since the 50s that comes to the Oscar in the foreign language category, depicting black life in a Latin American country. The first one was Black Orpheus, more than 50 years, and at that time, the film was submitted as a French film, not as a Brazilian film. So we have been able to do all that. We have been able to sustain the work. Uh, our films are in libraries, our films are in uh, universities and colleges, and we're still struggling. We are part of something, and at the beginning, I felt that this fact of trying to distribute Afrocentric uh, specialty and foreign language films was extremely marginal. Well, we are not at the center yet, but we st we're, less m uh, we're less marginal today. Certainly, and, you know, and what I love is that you know, it's not just uh, a festival for people of color. People who are interested in the African experience and the human experience will come and come to the festival as well. And just to introduce, of course, our filmmakers, and I'm so excited for you as a filmmaker myself, that you have your films in this festival. It's so exciting. So uh, first off, we have our lady sitting here. Now, I've, I've, I've seen you on uh, YouTube talking about raising funds or talking about like galvanizing people around your film and that's definitely uh you know certainly what that's part of the magic of getting our films out there so tell me who you are and a little bit about your film uh, my name is Nevla Naji um I'm a filmmaker and multimedia artist and the name of my film is Reflections Unheard Black Women and Civil Rights um Reflections Unheard is a feature-length documentary which focuses on black women's experiences in the civil rights movement and how particularly they were marginalized between the male-dominated black power movement and the white and middle-class feminist movement of the 60s and 70s. So we're focusing on the more radical movements um, of civil rights. And, and what made you get in, you know, pick this as a subject 
to, to focus on? Well, um, initially it did not start out as a film exclusively about civil rights. It was going to mostly focus on just discrimination against black women in society and the facets of race and gender discrimination and how they combine. And then I realized that, um, you know, through actually reading Elaine Brown's book, A Taste of Power, I realized that, you know, this is something that is not taught in school. This is something I never learned about. I was completely ignorant about it and that people need to know more about this, this part of uh, American history. And so I made it about civil rights because that was a time when these dynamics sort of um, came together publicly, people were talking about it, and it was also televised. So Wonderful. Uh, it's so magical to see, you know, a young woman, like, you know, embrace history in that way and, you know, step into, like, challenging, you know, what's currently out there and putting something else out there and challenging those stereotypes. Um, you know, did you find uh, that you had to really contest with uh, a mainstream which has a different perspective or was that not even you know on your mind when you when you made your film I mean uh, you know especially when we look at the controversy around race and everything like that uh, harping back to to this time some people say well you know it all happened so long ago or why do we need to focus on such history like how does it really help or empower us what has been your experience well I was inspired to make this film because of my personal experiences as a black woman in America and receiving um, these sorts of discrimination and prejudice that um, through, you know, reading other women's experiences, it helped put my experiences into perspective and it helped give context and, and helped me understand what was going on. And so I think a lot of those um, dynamics about, well, you know, the activism that's going on today uh, that, you know, for example, the black community, a lot of the activism that goes on is, is very much focused on black men's experiences. And while those, you know, things, you know, pertaining to, you know, mostly black men are very important, that that's not the only thing that's important, that a lot of time black, black women and the things that black women go through are ignored. And so I think a lot of these issues do have uh, relevancy to what's going on today. Wonderful, and I'm so glad you're bringing that to light, you know. So our next filmmaker on the panel, please tell us who you are and a little bit about your film also. My name is Jane Cherian. Um, I'm a filmmaker from India. And my film is, the name of my film is Papilio Bhutta. Papilio Bhutta. Bhutta. Which uh, means? Which means, which is, um, a particular species of butterfly, um, very endemic to the Western Ghats of India. The film is about uh, a group of uh, displaced, untouchables, Dalits of India. And the film focusing on the atrocities committed against Dalit people, untouchables, and indigenous people, uh, and against females uh, in India. So also mapping the ecocide uh, that go hand in hand in and with the genocide of the indigenous people of India. Wow, and um, what, what drove you to, to make a film about, about, about these people? And, I, and it's such an interesting subject as well. Yeah, the, no, I born and brought up uh, in uh, southern state of, one of the southern state of India, Kerala, which where I grew up with the caste system. Caste system, I feel that that is one of the worst form of racism which ever existed and which um, things uh, there's a notion in the Western world the caste is the past, but it is not. It is still very relevant, and the caste atrocities are committed all around the world, all around India, and still it is very live. And it is one of the most poisonous tool of oppression ever human beings invented. And it's it stay as a cultural scar on the uh, on India as a culture because they they contributed it very much into that. They created it. And uh, the film is based on real events which happened past uh, 10 years, a decade. And uh, not th it has uh, multiple uh, dimensions. It's not only just a person who is in India is considered as untouchable, is um, uh, as 
a particular race or as being black in the field and being uh, wretched. Beyond that, um, there is a dehumanizing element in that system. They are totally marginalized, totally neglected in the discourse of the development of India. Even one hand, it is portrayed as the biggest democracy in the world and the fastest growing economy. And this is only deals with the about the middle class or the upper caste or, or a privileged class people. But well, there is millions of people still live in poverty. Particular dichotomy in, in the economy, we can see a sub-Saharan poverty, if you can call that, at the same time a Scandinavian affluency, which a small group of people having. Right, and, it, it is, and it almost, it seems like it's a, the lack of inequality that really drives the situation in that you know the people that are called the untouchables are of either you know my complexion your complexion darker um and you know and sometimes their plight isn't even associated with the same plight as say the african americans and the links to slavery so you know they can be on you know forgotten so to bring such uh, a subject to, to light into the consciousness is so great and you know i already see the theme that these stories are personal you know coming from a personal place in terms of you know, self-exploration and, you know, the plight of women and yourself as mm -hmm. a black woman. And then, you know, the untouchables and, you know, being a person of color and in that caste system within India, um, exploring that. That's a beautiful thing. I can't wait to talk to you more. But let's move on to our third filmmaker and see what, see, see, let's see if we can find a little bit about his own person and his personal connection with his film. W tell us about who you are and your Well, my name is Derek Perry. I'm a director based in Brooklyn. And uh, my film is Prospect, playing at the festival on an opening night. And it's a, it's a personal film to me, but maybe a little less personal than uh, what these guys have done with their films. Uh, it's about a photographer in Brooklyn. And one day he goes to Prospect Park and he's shooting photos and encounters a lovely young woman and they hit it off and have a lovely day together. And um, throughout the day, things develop. And once he goes home, he realizes that uh, things might not be exactly what they seem with this lady. So um, I'll save the rest of it for Ooh. people who want to come watch, yeah. Hey, so you're good at selling your film. That, that's <laughs> <good>. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, Brooklyn, amazing place, um, which is why I moved there from London. Um, you know, what, what, you know wh what drove you to, to make a film about your... Well, for me, you know, uh, it seems like uh, on the screen, Central Park is the park that always gets a lot of love in New York. So for <coughs> me, I wanted to, s to showcase Prospect Park and show what a wonderful, beautiful park that was. It was actually designed by the, uh, the same people, the Olmsted brothers, so um, there's similarities, but to me, Prospect Park is a little bit of a greater park, so I just wanted to kind of show that off. And I wanted to use, um, you know, a lot of times when Brooklyn is featured on a film, it's very gritty and urban type style, and you know, that's there, but I also wanted to show the other side, which is like the nature and all the beautiful architecture along Eastern Parkway that looks very classical and European almost to me, so that was my thing to kind of show, show another side of Brooklyn that doesn't always get shown. Wonderful, wonderful. So, Ronaldo, I mean, like, y you know, the, I, 85, like 75, 85 films mm -hmm. from all yes. over the world. Like, this is amazing. Well, I'm, I'm sure that you have, with uh, the uh, three filmmakers we have here, uh, been able to see the diversity in the mm -hmm. selection of films. Absolutely. Uh, for example, talking about diversity, we have a film that I found, um, uh, this, this Angolan filmmaker, uh, Don Pedro is his name, and he made a film about, I've been to um, Uruguay and uh, Argentina in both places, and I know that what is known uh, as El Rio de la Plata is a place with a lot of music. Uh, tango, candombe, milongo, and all that is there. However, we do not know much about the African influence of that music, particularly in the case of tango. Mm -hmm. Don Pedro has made an incredible film based in the work of uh, Pedro Casares, if I remember his name, uh, the title of the film is Tango Negro, The African Roots of Tango. Wow. And he goes first to Argentina, he shows you what happened to black people in Argentina and the influence of these African people in the music we know as tango and the different variations of tango. And then he moves, he crosses the river and he goes to uh, Uruguay and in Montevideo you are exposed to Candombe, Milongon and a number of things and the film it, it moves very quickly uh, there's a lot of dance uh, uh, music played and all that this is one of the films that we have in the festival with the films that you heard about uh, we which have is so great because 
<laughs> like how you were s saying, like, you know, it's sometimes, you know, America gets so much love when it comes to the black experience. You know, uh, well, me growing up, you refer to, you know, to America with a lot of the, the films that are coming mm. out and stuff like that. And um, when it comes to, you know, Africa, that's another thing because we know about Nollywood. But then South America, which, you know, even going to Brazil, like, I mean, mm -hmm. going to Bahia, mm. like, the population is so African, it's unreal. But yet, you know, because so many of the people that come into Europe are from, uh, well, no, especially, you know, uh, European Brazilians. So you, you, you kind of forget that actually, uh, like a large majority, uh, you well, know, are people of African descent. So to see these films is amazing the, okay. to remind people. Exactly. That brings me to, I mean, now that you mentioned Brazil, uh, what, what we call, I mean, uh, the Latin American component, we have a whole day, I mean, uh, um, in four to five days, I mean, November 20th is go, I mean, we, s I mean, it is celebrated in Brazil the day of black consciousness. And that's December? The December 20th. Okay. And um, we are going to celebrate that day in the context of the festival. Uh, starting at 11 a.m., we're going to have at Columbia University Teachers College a number of films, and we're going to close with a film by the title uh, Raza Race in, in English, which is, I mean, there is a serious movement today in Brazil towards the uh, amelioration of the life of people of, of African descent. I remember when the, the one of the presidents went to Brazil and was surprised to see that there were blacks in Brazil and there was a problem with blacks in Brazil. Well, this film deals with that. I mean, this with the Quilombos, deal with um, uh, an Afro-Brazilian who is building something similar to BET over there, and he comes here trying to find some help. And that is a film, there's another um, uh, moment, another um, uh, participant in the film, who is a politician and he's trying to correct some type of legislature over there in order to incorporate some quota system in the universities in that country because they are onto something over there in terms of what is happening to the Afro-Brazilian population. Uh, the African Diaspora International Film Festival is perhaps one of the rare film festivals in the world that even though it's not labeled as a Latino film festival, there is this motivation to find Latino films depicting the Afro-Latino experience. And you have all kind of things. You have a film like uh, uh, Goodbye Momo, Dios Momo, which is from Uruguay, and this, this boy who sells newspapers in the streets of Montevideo, and all the tribulations he goes through in order to make some money, send his sister to the school and all that. And then we have a couple of comedies. This is an incredible filmmaker from uh, South Africa, uh, Luruli, his last name, Museveni Luruli. I mm -hmm. uh, think he'll be here. And he has a film, Chicken Business, is the title of the Chick film. Chicken Business. Chicken I mean Business. <laughs> yes. Okay. And it's, it's a guy <laughs> who goes to sell chickens in the market and all the, the situations that happen in the market. And you laugh. I mean, it's incredibly funny, but it's, very in it's, a, it's a very intelligent film. So one of the things that we wanted to do from the very first... Uh, yeah. year was to show, yes, there is drama, yes, there is uh, history, but there is also the poetry of our lives in the world. I mean, I have been in many places in which people sit with me and tell me stories that you cannot believe. And you laugh, you cry, you dance, mm -hmm. but this is all of us. We have our unique experience and we mold it the best way we can wherever we are. Exactly. And, it's, and what I love about what you said is that um, you know, we that we are so diverse as a people, you know, and there is not just one, you know, black experience, if we're going to call it that. Um, so just even, you know, connecting collectively and understanding that, you know, whether we're showing it through drama, documentary, comedy, that there are so many stories that are outside of the mainstream, which are actually our mainstream in terms exactly. of, you know, we have our own flow. So um, I'm so happy that you're, you know, you're suggesting, you know, telling people about all these different uh, films that they can go and see, but just so that people know, the festival starts when? Okay, we are going to be on on November 29th. Uh, the opening night, the big event, is here at uh, in Manhattan because we had an early start in uh, Queens at the Black Spectrum Theatre, and then we'll continue here. We'll, we'll go back to Black Spectrum during the festival, but here on the 29th, we'll be at the Symphony Space Dahlia Theatre, with the opening night program, his film, um, Chasing his film Shakespeare. Prospect. Yes, Prospect okay. will be part of the opening night program. Chasing Shakespeare, a film um, in which uh, Danny Glover 
plays an incredible role, a very spiritual relationship between an African-American man who is married to a Native American woman. Wonderful. And the people can find this information on your website as well. Exactly. So, because you have like 85 films, and I, I don't want you to sit here and recite all of the synopsis for the 85 films tonight, but it's fascinating to know that you, you know, are so passionate about the, the filmmakers that you support. And, um, you know, that's such a wonderful thing, and, uh, you know, I really hope that our filmmakers here, you know, like really, get, you know, get that experience of, you know, the film festival and that vibe and everything that, that surrounds it. Um, you have a, a trailer, so I want you to set that up as you, okay. you talk, um, just so that, you know, our audience can just get a, a sense of the juiciness of mm -hmm. the films mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are going to be shown. But, um, you know, tell us about the trailer and, um, you know, you said the, the festival starts on the 29th and it goes on into December, right? To December 15th. To I the 15th. So that's me. quite... You know, that's a considerable yes, time for a it's film it's festival. it's a long <laughs> event, uh, very demanding. Uh, we have people in and out, and those who are based here, I mean, all, all over the place, because we are at Black Spectrum Theatre in Queens. We are at uh, Teachers College, Columbia University. There we use two theaters, the Chapel and the Cowan Center. We are at the Quad Cinema uh, wow. in the village, and we also work with the... Uh, Symphony Space Talia Theater. So we are in four locations, moving around, having parties, discussions, and uh, celebrating the human experience of people of color, because this is the essence of the festival, to celebrate that we are, I mean, th there's a film, talking about films again. <laughs> oh no, let's, <laughs> let's see the trailer <laughs> first. Let's see the trailer first, and then we can talk about more films. Okay. You have your three filmmakers and their films. I, you know, I honestly, like, we do need, like, about five hours to go through, like, 85 films. <laughs> and that's why our audience will go to your website to find out what's going on so they can come and experience Perfect. it for themselves. Perfect. Um, but, yeah, so the, the, the trailer, this is your, you know, the, the 21st edition, right? Yes. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I do not know everything in that trailer. Uh, I think uh, there is part of uh, Prospect. I think there's part of uh, Papi Lebuda. Uh, what else? I think we have uh, uh, Alice Walker, uh, oh. the film about Alice Walker, which is, I mean, a big poem. I would love to see that. What one. else do we have? But I mean, maybe we need to take a look at it. So Let's I, I take will a remember. look at it. Are we, are we ready with that trailer from the African Diaspora International Film Festival 2013 with its like 85 films over two and a half weeks and millions of filmmakers, <laughs> uh, you know, from all around the globe and everything. It's going to be really exciting and it's happening here in New York City. So if we can see that trailer, that would be awesome. Take it away, Nat in Control Room. Have we got it? We do have it. It's been set up. So as it's been set up, oh, it's here. Here we are, the African Diaspora International Film Festival. Wonderful. It's sunny all day, it'll be sunny all day tomorrow. Storm is coming, trust me. not Romeo called.
with all the poles sticking out of your roof? It attracts lightning. I thought the whole point was to keep lightning away, but to each his own. You can never keep lightning from where it wants to go. My William, he found me. Venus, I never stopped running. Cool, cool. So you know, like in in that we had a, a sample of of your film, right? No. Oh, of no, Prospect. This is, this is Jason Shakespeare. Good part of the opening night program. Mm -hmm. okay. he, he is part of it, but this is not his film. Okay. Um, Jason Shakespeare. Uh, it's, it's it's a love story, but a love story that moves in the years, and you see, the film moves back and forth between. The moment when they encounter each other, when they get to know each other, and over, um, and they are able to overcome their differences, and then the relationship, and when the woman disappears, and what happened. It so, when you pick these films, what what's the? I mean, cause, you know, the the stories are beautiful, and like there are so many different themes, and mm -hmm. um, you know, like you said, whether it's a comedy and just like some simple nuances of life. Um, you know what? How do you select a film for a film festival, and especially for you know um, aspiring filmmakers out there, and even those who are you know indulging in media today and thinking like you know how do I find a platform for my film? Is it worth mm. putting my film into a festival? Well, I mean, uh, the film industry is uh, a complicated business, and in our case, as I said earlier, I am not trained in films the, the way is. Uh, people are trained in films. I mean, I, I, this is an inspiration. I, I watch the film. Sometimes I have to watch a film more than once. And uh, we go, we discuss at the office. I mean, sometimes we uh, give the, uh, the film to somebody else because we have a team. Uh, and we, we try to essentially bring compelling stories because we call the African Diaspora International Film Festival a festival of discoveries. A festival where, I mean, many things are going to be revealed. You might like some of them, you might not. For example, we have a film that I know is going to be controversial, but this is part of film festivals. Film festivals, to a cer certain extent, have replaced the uh, neighborhood movie theaters that uh, could play certain things that mainstream theaters could not play because those little films don't make money. Mm -hmm. And this is the issue, I mean, this is the difference between uh, a company like ours, the one I represent, Armatan Productions, we are into Afrocentric, foreign language, and specialty films. Those films, as far as I am concerned, are not films with the aim of making millions. They are not, they don't have what it takes to make a hundred million dollars. But those are films that bring into the people's imagination a number of things that are important because people, human beings, are, uh, need meaningful stories in, in films. Right, and I and I see you nodding, Nev. There, you know, the this this idea that you know, will will my film be seen, and by how many people, if it were not for you know festivals such as um, the African Diaspora, um, you know, what wh when do, is this something that you've been thinking about whilst making your film? Um, you know, you're passionate about the subject, you want people to see it, but then you know, what are the steps that you need to take in order to make it? Uh, you know, make it something that's not just a, a film that family and friends appreciate? Um, well, I think that, that your last question about what makes a good film that other people want to see, um, I, I guess I, I didn't embark on my own journey in film with my audience in mind. I know some filmmakers do, but I, f I honestly feel like if you are a marginalized filmmaker that, you know, you have to make films to a large extent for yourself and you have to make it because you're passionate about it because there are so many hurdles in the way. And so I never assumed that I was going to necessarily draw a, a very wide audience or that I would make a whole bunch of money but I knew that it was an important story and it was important to me and that it would be important for a lot of other people to see um, and that it needed to be there, you know, it needed to be produced. Um, 
So I, I suppose I would just say that I feel like for me and you know, my suggestion to other filmmakers who are marginalized would be to just make films uh, that you're passionate about and allow the audience to come to you because they will. Like, there's always going to be people who want to see your film. Take, for instance, uh, I mean, Jay, we met in Montreal during the film festival. Yes, Jay. Okay, Jay. And, you, you, and you're, you came over from India, you're, you, you're over from India or you live in? Uh, I live in New York. You live in New York, okay. So, I mean, I see his film and one of the big themes in festivals like ours and many festivals is that of the exclusion of people because of their difference, because of their uh, uh, religion and all that. Sure. So, I mean, the more I watch the film, the more I feel that this is a film that is going to bring uh, a new perspective, not only to the festival, for those who keep talking about what is to be excluded as an African-American or as a woman. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the discourse that the film festival started in 1993. Uh, this. Uh, persistence in presenting this movement movement of images and ideas that reveal many things because I keep talking about the the revealing nature of art and for me films are art films are not necessarily a commodity that I use to make money as soon as I can this is not the way we see films in the festival and the the risks in diversity the risk in genre and in many other things Mm. So, you know, when you, it, it's interesting that you mentioned that because there's been a lot of discussion recently about, you know, the, this, the idea of, you know, the black filmmaker and, you know, what, what it takes to really get our films out there. And, you know, with the, um, you know, th th this the whole thing with the, the crowdfunding and especially, you know, Spike Lee doing his um, crowdfunding campaign and it being s successful, uh, you know, people started to rethink like the the model of how you get your film made because for so long, uh, you know, black filmmakers have been you know sort of on the fringe of Hollywood and thinking that you know that's the you know our access point. But now, in fact, if someone likes your idea, you know, it's it's more whether it's uh, they're passionate about the idea or passionate about film or the subject matter, they can in help you endorse your film by supporting it in some way through a crowdfund. Um, and, and, and that's a beautiful thing. Um, for example, uh, you know, with your film Prospect, you know, what, what avenues did you take to, to get it made? And um, you know, did you call on the larger community to help that happen? Well, you know, when I, when I first started Prospect, uh, Kickstarter was in its infancy and starting to get a name for itself. And I very, very uh, took some time to consider doing that. But this being my first short film, to me personally, I wanted to do it myself and improve to myself I could be done within my own means before I went out there to the larger world and sort of asked them to come support me. Um, so this was all completely self-funded, self-produced, but uh, on my next one, I will take a different route for that. Okay, okay. And, um, and with yourself, um, this, this idea of like, you know, merging the, the cultural experience from India, bringing it over into a different landscape of America to educate and inform people, um, you know, where do you see your film going next? You know, after you've done the festivals, are you going to put it to DVD? How, you know, what is the journey for your film? So, we face um, a huge resistance from the government of India. Um, in India, we have censorship. And after we shot the movie, and we cannot show in anywhere without any government certificate to certifying it. In case of Papilia Buddha, they deny the certificates. And we went to the court. There is a long fight, like uh, eight months in the court. And still, the film is banned in India in its full form. It's actually banned? Banned in different various levels. They want about 26 cuts from the movie, and certain parts supposed to be cuts, and we went to the court. Wow. And it was like a long fight. And that fight is um, still we win, but we are not but we cannot show in the original form. The government did the editorial intervention to our film. It was a huge kind of uh, attack on artistic expression. And we call ourselves democracy and, uh, and free country. But, but it shows the power of your film, right? Yeah. <laughs> the power of your okay, film the that they're like, censor, we're going to have to, sorry. <laughs> I, I want to tell something about India has a huge African diaspora too, not the ancient Aboriginal 
uh, and indigenous and Dalit people have Dalit uh, African ancestry. Beyond that, there is a particular diaspora since 14th century, like uh, Indian Ocean diaspora from Africa, Siddhis, and we have African people who was not only as the part of the slave trade in, in Indian Ocean, but also there is sailors, merchants, even um, the people who rule. One of the king in Central India who has the African ancestry. That's a part of African diaspora. Recently in Harlem, there was a African diaspora in, in India um, exhibition was there uh, in the gallery. The the few yeah, very few people knows about that. So India has kind of a huge African diaspora. The Indian African people wear saris and speak Indian languages. And still the, we have that diaspora, diaspora spread all over. You can see the film, the people in India, especially the Dalit people, they are, uh, you can trace the ancestry of the people. Isn't that yeah. amazing? And to find out that we're all connected and the fact that you're using this medium to bring that knowledge to people I is a beautiful thing. Um, you know, as we're talking, if we can get the, uh, the next clip set up um, for Prospect, which is, is your trailer, um, you know, we can have a, a little look at that and, and see like the, the I mean, I s especially with Prospect, you know, it was great cinematography mm. and the filmmaking, you know, was wonderful. And, um, you know, even as you said that, you know, this time around you decided not to call on the support of your community. Um, how, you know, and this is to all of you, how do you feel about uh, when it comes to, you know, like us supporting each other? And when I say the us, I say it loosely because depending on what you define as the us, but when people reach out to the community and say, well, you know, we make these films for you, you should come and participate in watching them. Do people come? Do people come and support? Um, and is, you know, maybe the stereotype which yeah. people project that we don't support each other? Um, you know, what have you found to be your own experience? Is that true or not? Mm. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just speak to that quickly. Um, you know, I've found I've done about six festivals with Prospect, um, and they've all been sort of centered in people of color as far as the thematically. And I found um, a lot of support with people in Chicago, places like I was just in Atlanta last week, and people coming out to the community and, and viewing these films and talking about them and being excited about them. So I found it to be a very kind of tight knit community. You know, you see the same faces at some of these festivals, and you guys start to build a relationship and. It's been very nice to see that, you know, we can sort of have our own industry with inside of, you know, the larger film, film industry. Wonderful. Um, do, we, do we have the, the, f the, the trailer for Prospect? Because it'd be great to see that and uh, to see, you know, your, your clip, to get excited about uh, going to see it. Um, what day is yours showing? Um, I'll be screening on, uh, April on November 29th, uh, the opening on night. On the opening yes, night. Yes, with uh, Ch Chasing Shakespeare. And then I have uh, two more screenings on the, uh, I think the 7th of December and the uh, last date I'm not quite sure of. Okay, so that Brooklyn film that yeah. you guys want to see, uh, you can check it out um, via the website. And yes, look, see, and the website is um, uh, Ronaldo, oh, N-Y-A-D-I-F-F, -F, which stands for obviously New York African Diaspora International Film Festival dot org. So, uh, you know, go check it out now. Um, so do we have we have prospect, right? Let's check out that trailer, uh, and so uh, our audience can be even more enticed about uh, what's going on. So hit it, Nat. Go for it. Towards the future, right? Depends on what lies ahead. What are the chances I'll see you again? Anything is possible. We have a magical thing that works very well together. And both are love stories, which I love very much. But anyway, he's here. <laughs> and he's here. Yeah, so I mean, it, it sounds exciting. The and it's, it's a short film, right? Yes, it's a short film. Um, it was a, originally I wrote a, a forty-five minute script, and I basically pared that down into the, the essential twelve minutes to tell the story. That's wonderful. And now, w when we're talking about like storytelling, we you know we have various different, well, definitely different different stories, but um, you know we have this 
kind of, you know, it's now made me start to think like, oh, I want to find out more about like, you know, the, the subject matters. And you, mm. like you were saying about um, this idea of telling, you know, the story that shows us and reflects us in a, a different light, you mm. know, and it not necessarily to say that it's going to be, you know, just all hail positive of the black experience, but it's going to show the truth of, of the experience. Um, and when, you know, and especially when we, we go back to, like, say, documentary, for example, and it'd be great if we can line up um, Nev's film, um, your trailer, it's, um, you know, this idea that you have an opinion about what you're, you know, you're presenting, and how important is that? Uh, and, and in fact, I'm, I'm kind of crossing between both of you because both of the, those stories, I mean, what, you know, really kind of heartfelt in terms of the passion, um, but also the, the understanding of the oppression. And often we find, especially when we look at like the Pan-African film festivals that are around, a lot of the films now are about the, you know, this new consciousness of understanding like, hey, wait, this is who we are and our history informs mm. that today. Um, and, you know, uh, Ronaldo here um, championing that, that whole idea. Do you, um, I guess I'm trying to ask like, you know, do you, like where, it's almost like an author writing a book. Like, where do you, where do you feel that it's placed in in the sense that in the in the bigger picture of the of who we are? Like, um, you know, with your film now, um, you know, d can you imagine outreaching with people to perhaps, you know, connect with people, you know, through the education system, or it becomes a film that's a film and and that's it. Um, well, reflections and heard has actually um, reached. A wide range of universities, and it is, uh, it has been mostly universities that have screened the film so far until this fall when I, I started um, screening at festivals and doing its first festival run. So I think that um, I'm I'm discovering that it has appeal in in both sectors, in the, both the educational sector that it can be used as a learning tool, but that the aesthetic is such that it's like a, a visually interesting way to, to tell the story so that it also can appeal to other people who are just interested in it as a film, so. And we have, we have this film being set up right now with Nat. You were just about to say something as, as it's being set up, ready to play. Well, I mean, um, her film is a film that leads people into a reflection because, I mean, maybe I'm a, I am advanced in something, but uh, I heard more and more people talking about the possibility of having a female president in the next election. And it is important to talk about and reflect upon the situation of women in this society, mm -hmm. particularly in our communities. Because if there is a next president who is a female, I am almost sure that she's not going to be black. So what are we doing in that direction, in the direction of giving women of color in this country the possibility of being discussed as potential presidents too. Mm. And this film, her film, leads in that reflection. What have we done in terms of the civil rights movement in order to advance the cause of women of African descent in the political arena? Wow, so reflections unheard. Let's check it out. There wasn't um, even stated very many men who embraced what we now would call feminism. I mean, we women had to fight for our place. And we almost didn't do it based on, I guess you would say, feminist principles, but based on, hey, we do the work. We go to jail. We get beaten. We're doing the same thing you do. So we have as much right to determine the direction of this movement as you do. But there clearly was in the black power movement this thing about black males taking back their rights as males that had been stripped from them, you know, during slavery and Jim Crow. When a public official orders a group of men to get back to work and then we'll talk, and treats them as though they are not men, that's a racist point of view. And no matter how you dress it up in terms of whether or not a union could organize, it's still racism. For at the heart of racism is the idea that a man is not a man. 
I don't know that I've ever faced discrimination as a woman as yet. And I think that's because the racial situation in America makes most black women face discrimination as black. I don't think that uh, the movement is as relevant to the needs of, of uh, poor women and minority women. So it's a cliffhanger right there. It's always that like you did it on purpose. I want to see your film. Um, so, you know, as as you said, I mean, like, imagine um, a female president, like, just you know, <laughs> okay. but to drive, you know, a film that drives at least, you know, the conversation that can be had. And I know, um, you know, through um, Sam Anderson, who is actually featured in a film that I'm making at the moment called Ninety Nine Percent Occupied, which you should definitely go and like on Facebook. Uh, it's called Ninety Nine Percent Occupied Film. Uh, his wife, Rosemary Mealy, is in your film. Uh, you know, so it's like this connection of activism. Now, um, we're, we're soon to be wrapping up, and um, I just want everyone to know where they can come see you guys uh, and support your work and be part of, you know, this collective experience, as we said, about, uh, you know, showing us as, you know, the humanizing experience of who we are from many different perspectives. So just as we, we close, just please remind everyone about your film, where they can see it. Uh, my film will be showing on uh, December 3rd. It's uh, Tuesday, December 3rd in the evening. I believe it's at 6, 6.30, around that time. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. And it's on um, unheard reflections. Yes, reflections unheard. Black reflections women. Reflections unheard. Black women in civil rights. Black women in civil rights. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So also they can check the website as well. Yeah, the so website www.yellowcatproductions.com. Yo, my film is showing at Quad Cinema on December sixth. Uh, December sixth. Yeah, seven thirty p.m. Wow! And remind everyone the name of the title the of your the film. The title is uh, Papilio Buta. Papilio Buta. And you have additional screenings um, on uh, December 8th and 12th. Wonderful. And that's yeah. the about the yeah. experience of the untouchables in India. In so India. certainly one to go, go see. And lastly, Prospect. Yes, my film Prospect will be screening uh, opening night on the 29th with Chasing Shakespeare. And it will also be screening on the 8th of December and the 12th. And if you'd like to find out more about it, you can go to prospectbrooklyn.com and check out the trailer and some more information about the film. Wonderful, uh, wonderful filmmakers that I really suggest that you all support and go check out their words. So, um, so just as we wrap up, Renata, please tell everyone where they can come find this wonderful festival okay. of yours. Well, I mean, as I said, four venues um, in Queens, uh, Black Spectrum Theater, Quad Cinema, um, uh, Cowin Center, Teachers College, Columbia University, and Quad Cinema. Uh, www.nyadiff.org and 212-864-1760. They can call and get information. Uh, tickets are available th uh, online. And uh, we are going to have an incredible lineup. Uh, I couldn't, I mean, we don't have time to talk about everything we have here. Uh, for example, we have the film uh, Jews in Egypt, which is about the presence of Jews in Egypt in very specific moment. Uh, are we talking about African Jews or Jews well, Israel. we're talking about Jews, how the Jewish community evolved with time in Egypt and what happened during those years. A very important film, historically speaking, and in terms of the interaction between religions because, for example, I didn't talk much about it, but we present films from North Africa since the very beginning and we have a package of films uh, coming from that part of Africa in which this preoccupation North African filmmakers have with the uh, liberation of women, um, like uh, for example, Shehera's I Tell Me Story that we show last year. This year we have a film, The Miscreants, dealing with fundamental Muslims and regular folks from uh, Islamic oriented society and their, how they clash and things of that sort. So, Jews of Egypt is a film that walks into that space of how in North Africa, which are countries, uh, the countries there have a strong Islamic orientation, how those who are not of the Islamic persuasion interact with the others. I mean, the director of Shehera's Ad Tell Me Story is a Copt person. I mean, he's, he's Christian and he lives in Egypt. And we discuss many things pertaining to his uh, religious orientation, his work, and life him over there. So we, we bring all those different layers that are 
important components of the human experience of people of color. We are multicultural, multi-religious, multi-racial. So all that is there, and the festival has that mission and that vision. Wonderful. And now, you know, so I guess you have panel discussions as well? Yes, we do. We have many uh, in, uh, guests coming from Africa, from uh, Brazil, and they will participate in different moments, discussing with the audience, and uh, films with filmmakers, and in uh, interaction they film with... Um, with uh, Alice Walker, the director will be there, and we are working with Alice Walker to have a Skype conversation with the audience, Professor Farah Griffey. There's so the much, there's <laughs> so much, and we're just about to end Ancestor House. So you know what, guys, you're going to have to go check out the website. This has been Ancestor House. My name is Dami Akinusi. Thank you so much for being our guest on the show. African Diaspora International Film Festival. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, God. Not to know the family story is bad. Not to want to know it is worse. But to pass on ignorance to someone is like, it's like passing on a curse. And it will curse your father, curse your mother, curse your sister, curse your brother. And every time you come close to one another, it will be there in between to separate and instigate.